This evening, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to welcome Tom Bissell for a discussion of his new book, Extra Lives, Why Video Games Matter. While the easy stereotype that your average video game player is an antisocial teenage boy, the truth is that millions of people, men, women, young, old, and middle-aged alike, play video games nearly every day. Video games not only out-earn major Hollywood films, they're often the motivation behind major movie releases, like Prince of Persia or Resident Evil. Yet despite prevalence and earning power, video games are essentially to be considered to be lowbrow entertainment. Tom Bissell, in his latest book, strikes out to uncover why, and also argue for video games' consideration as an acceptable art form. Paste Magazine calls the book a truly indispensable work of literary nonfiction, and Publishers Weekly hails it as a scintillating meditation on the promise and discontents of video games. My favorite review, however, comes from the LA Times with this provocative assessment. Quote, this journalistic memoir is not only about the meaning of video games, it's about the heat and hesitation of love. Tom Bissell is a journalist, critic, and writer. He's the author of Chasing the Sea, God Lives in St. Petersburg, and The Father of All Things. He has written for many, many publications, including McSweeney's, Boston Review, Granta, Harper's Magazine, New Republic, and the Virginia Quarterly Review, where he is a uh, contributing editor. His work has also been widely anthologized, and you often find his reviews in the New York Times Book Review. When he's not teaching at Portland State University, I understand Mr. Bissell is often playing video games, and you'll find Mr. Bissell's gamer tags on the back flap of your book. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience and for joining us. Please join me in welcoming Tom Bissell. Hey everyone, uh, I should say that my um, friend slots are rapidly filling up, so if you do uh, want to request my online friendship, please hurry. Um, so I've done, I think it's my third reading here at Harvard Bookstore, and I have to say this is my largest crowd by a factor of three, so um, uh, I suspect this has something to do with the subject matter. Um, I'm going to read uh, part of the third chapter. And then uh, I would just we can open it up and, and talk about talk about games. I'm going to lift this a bit. Uh, the third chapter of this book is called "The Unbearable Lightness of Games." I've been publishing long enough now to look back on much and to look back on much of what I have written and feel the sudden pressing need to throw myself off the nearest bridge. Every person lucky enough to turn a creative pursuit into a career has these moments. And at least, I sometimes tell myself, I do not often look back on my writing with shame. I am ashamed of one thing, however, and that is an essay I contributed to a nonfiction anthology of young writing. I was encouraged to write about anything I pleased, so long as it addressed what being a young writer today felt like. I wrote about video games and whether they were a distraction from the calling of literature. Even as I was writing it, I was aware that the essay did not accurately reflect my feelings. Recently, I wondered if the essay was maybe somewhat better than I remembered. I then reread it and spent much of the following afternoon driving around, idly looking for bridges. As for video games, I wrote, and I warned you, this is a terrible essay, very few people over the age of 40 would recognize them as even a lower form of art. I am always wavering as to where I would locate video games along art's fairly forgiving sliding scale. Video games are obviously and manifestly a form of popular art, and po every form of popular art, and every form of art, popular or otherwise, has its ghettos, from the crack houses along Michael Bay Avenue to the tubercular prostitutes coughing at the corner of Steele and Patterson, as in Danielle and James. The video game is the youngest and increasingly most dominant popular art form of our time. To study the origins of any popular new medium is to become an archaeologist of skeptical opprobrium. It seems to me that anyone passionate about video games has better things to do than walk chin first into sucker punch arguments about whether they qualify as art. Those who do not believe video games are or ever will be art deserve nothing more goading or indulgent than a smile. I think that's what I was trying to say. But I was then and am now routinely torn about whether video games are a worthy way to spend my time and often ask myself why I like them as much as I do, especially when, very often, I hate them. Sometimes I think I hate them because of how purely they bring me back to childhood, when I could only imagine what I would do if I were single-handedly fighting off an alien army or driving down the street in a very fast car while the police, police try to shoot out my tires, or told that I was the ancestral inheritor of some primeval sword and my destiny was to rid the realm of evil. These are very intriguing scenarios if you are 12 years old. 
They are far less intriguing if you are 35 and have a career, friends, a relationship, or children. The problem, however, at least for me, is that they are no less fun. I like fighting aliens, and I like driving fast cars. Tell me the secret sword is just over the mountain, and I will light off into goblin-haunted territory to claim it. For me, video games often restore an unearned, vaguely loathsome form of innocence, an, is an innocence derived of not knowing anything. For this and all sorts of other complicated historical reasons, starting with the fact that they began as toys marketed directly to children, video games crash any cocktail party rationale you attempt to formulate as to why exactly you love them. More than any other form of entertainment, video games tend to divide rooms into us and them. We are, in effect, admitting that we like to spend our time shooting monsters, and they are, not unreasonably, failing to find the value in that. I wrote in my essay that art is, again I quote, I'm sorry, obligated to address questions allergic to mere entertainment. In my humble estimation, no video game has yet crossed the Rubicon from entertainment to true art. Here I was trying to say that what distinguishes one work of art from another is primarily intelligence, which is as multivalent as art itself. Artistic or creative intelligence can express itself formally, stylistically, emotionally, thematically, morally, or any number of ways. Works of art we call masterpieces typically run the table on the many forms artistic intelligence can take. They are comprehensively intelligent. This kind of intelligence is, is usually apparent in great works of art created by individuals. Unity of artistic effect is something human beings have learned to respond to, and for obvious reasons, human beings have, <clears throat> and for obvious reasons, this is best achieved by individual artists. Many games, which are, to be sure, corporate entertainments created by dozens of people with a strong expectation of making a lot of money, have more formal and stylistic intelligence they know, than they know what to do with, and not even trace amounts of thematic, emotional, or moral intelligence. One could argue that these games succeed as works of art in some ways, and either fail or do not attempt to succeed in others. True art makes the attempt to succeed in every way available to it. At least I think so. My ambivalence goes deeper, though. A few years ago, I was asked by a magazine for my year-end roundup of interesting aesthetic experiences, among which I included 2K Boston's peerless first-person shooter Bioshock, which, I wrote, I would hesitate to call a legitimate work of art, even though its engrossing and intelligent storyline made it the first game to absorb me without also vaguely embarrassing me for being so absorbed. Seeing that half-hearted encomium in print with my name attached to it about a game I adored, obsessed over, and thought about for weeks drove home the plunger of a fresh, fresh syringe of shame. Was I apologizing to some imaginary cultural arbiter for finding value in a form of creative expression whose considerable deficits I recognize but which I nevertheless believe is important? Or is this evidence of an authentic scruple? On one hand, I love Bioshock, which is frequently saluted as one of the first games to tackle what might be considered intellectual subject matter, namely a game world exploration of the social consequences inherent within Ayn Rand's objectivism. On the other hand, what passes for intellectual subject matter in a video game is still far from intellectually compelling, at least for me, and I know I was not imagining the feeling of slipping hourglass loss I experienced when I played Bioshock 10 hours a day for three days straight. If I really wanted to explore the implications and consequences of objectivism, there were better, more sophisticated places to look. Even a few of them would be as much fun, though getting shot in the knee would be more fun than rereading Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> when I think about games, here is where I bottom out. Is it OK that they are mostly fun? Am I a Philistine or simply a coward? Are games the problem, or am I? I came to this once embarrassed, formerly furtive love of games honestly. Because the majority of the games I have enjoyed most as an adult tell stories, I was always comparing those stories with the novels and films I admire. Naturally, I found, and find, most video game stories wanting. But this may be a flagrant category error. For one thing, no one is sure what purpose story actually serves in video games. Games with any kind of narrative structure usually employ two kinds of storytelling. One is the frame narrative of the game itself set in the fictional present, and traditionally doled out in what are called cutscenes or cinematics, which in most cases take control away from the gamer, who is then forced to watch the scene unfold. The other, which some game designers and theoreticians refer to as the ludonarrative, is unscripted and gamer-determined, the fun portion of the played game, and usually amounts to some frenetic reconception of getting from point A to point B. The differences between the framed narrative and ludonarrative are what makes story in games so unmanageable. One is fixed, the other is fluid, and yet they are intended, however notionally, to work together. Their historical inability to do so may be best described as congressional. 
Several games have lately been experimenting with allowing decisions made during the Ludo narrative to alter the frame narrative, most notably in Fallout 3 and Lionhead's Fable 2, but this is mainly expressed in how, are you and how you are perceived by other characters. Once a game comes along that figures a way around the technical challenges of allowing a large number of Ludo narrative decisions to have frame narrative altering consequences, none of which challenges I understand, but whose existence several game designers sighingly confirmed for me, an altogether new form of storytelling might be born. Stories that, with your help, create themselves. There is, of course, another word for stories that, with your help, create themselves. That word is life. So would this even be a good thing? I'm not so sure. When I'm being entertained, I'm also being manipulated. I'm allowing myself to be manipulated. I am, in other words, surrendering. When I watch television, one of our less exalted forms of popular entertainment, I'm surrendering to the inevitability of commercials amid bite-sized narrative blocks. When I watch a film, the most imperial form of popular entertainment, particularly when experienced in a prop proper movie theater, I'm surrendering most humiliatingly, for the film begins at a time I cannot control, has nothing to sell me that I have not already purchased, and goes on whether or not I happen to be in my seat. When I read a novel, I am not only surrendering, I am allowing my mind to be occupied by a colonizer of uncertain intent. Entertainment takes it as a given that I cannot affect it other than in brutish exterior ways, turning it off, leaving the theater, pausing the disc, stuffing in a bookmark, underlining a phrase. But for those television programs, films, and novels febrile with self-consciousness, entertainment pretends it is unaware of me, and I allow it to. Playing games is not quite like this. The surrender is always partial. You get control and are controlled. Games are patently aware of you and have a physical dimension unlike any other form of popular entertainment. On top of that, many require a marathon runner's stamina. Certain console games can take as many as 40 hours to complete and, unlike books, you cannot bring them along for enjoyment during mass transit dead time. Rarely has wide-ranging familiarity with a medium so transparently privileged the un- and underemployed. And as a writer, I can very much vouch for that. Even though you may be granted lunar influence over the game's narrative tides, the fact that there is any narrative at all reminds you that a presiding intelligence exists within the game along with you. And it is this sensation that invites the otherwise unworkable comparisons between games and other forms of narrative art. Yes, as difficult as it sometimes is to believe, games have authors, however diminutive an aura, aura he or she, or frequently they, might exude. What often strikes me whenever I'm playing a game is how glad I am of that hovering authorial presence. Although I enjoy the freedom of games, I also appreciate the remindful crack of the narrative whip. To seek entertainment is to seek that whip, and the mixture of the two is what makes games such a seductive, appealingly dyadic form of entertainment. A video game whose outcomeless narrative is wholly determined by my actions, as in, say, World of Warcraft, which is less a video game than a digital board game, and which game I very much dislike. I'm sorry if there's any WoW fans here. <laughs> would elevate me into a position of accidental authorship I do not covet and render the game itself a chilly collation of behavior trees and algorithms. I want to be told a story, albeit one I happen to be part of and can affect, even if in small ways. If I wanted to tell a story, I would not be playing video games. A noisy group of video game critics and theoreticians laments the rise of story in games. Critics, excuse me, games in one version of this view are best exemplified as total play, wherein the player is an immaterial demiurge and the only narrative is what is anecdotally generated during play. Tetris would be the best example of this sort of game. My suspicion is that this lament comes less from frustration with story qua story than it does from the narrative butterfingers on outstanding display in the vast majority of contemporary video games. I share that frustration. I also love being the agent of chaos in the video game world. What I want from games, a control as certain and seamless as the means by which I am being controlled, may be impossible, and I am back to where I began. Reload. The story purpose serves in video games is complicated then. Less complicated is how many gamers view story. For many gamers, and by all evidence, game designers, story is largely a matter of accumulation. The more explanation there is, the thought appears to go, the more story has been generated. This would be a profound misunderstanding of story for any form of narrative art, but it has hobbled the otherwise high creative achieve achievement of any number of games. Frequently in work with any degree of genre loyalty, this would include the vast majority of video games, the more explicit the story becomes, the more silly it will suddenly seem. Let us call this the midichlorian error. The best science fiction is usually densely realistic in quotidian detail, but evocatively vague about the bigger questions. 
Tolkien is all but ruined for me whenever I make the mistake of perusing the Anglo-Saxon Talmudisms of his various appendices. Among the Eldar, the alphabet of Daron did not develop true cursive forms. Kill me, please, now. <laughs> Since for writing, the elves adopted the Fenorian letters. As for horror films, the moment I learned Freddy Krueger was the bastard son of a thousand maniacs was also the final moment I could envision him without spontaneously bursting into laughter. The impulse to explain is the Achilles heel of all genre work, and the most sophisticated artists within every genre know better than to expose their worlds to the sharp knife of intellection. A good example of a game that does not make that mistake is Valve's cooperative first-person shooter Left 4 Dead, which offers yet another vision of zombie apocalypse. Unlike the Resident Evil series, which goes to great narrative pains to explain what is happening and why, culminating in one of the most ridiculous moments in video game history, when the hero of Resident Evil 4 discovers an enemy doc document helpfully titled, Our Plan. <laughs> <laughs> Left 4 Dead abandons every rational pretext and drops you and three other characters into the middle of undead anarchy. Almost nothing is explained. The little characterization there is comes in tantalizing dribs. And all that is expected is survival, which is possible only by constantly working together with your fellow gamers, covering them while they reload, helping them up when they are knocked down, and saving them when they are trapped in the eye of a zombie hurricane. Left 4 Dead is one of the most well-designed and explosively entertaining games ever made. While its purpose is incontinent terror, its point is that teamwork is, by definition, a matter of compulsion, not choice. Left 4 Dead's designer, Michael Booth, had the maturity to grasp the power that narrative minimalism would provide his game. The speedy and acrobatic zombies of Left 4 Dead have no plan more refined than kicking you to death. As a scenario, it is as ridiculous as any forged by the Vulcans of video game conceit, and yet, from start to finish, Left 4 Dead is as free-fallingly unfamiliar and viscerally convincing as the worst dream you have ever had. Capturing what Left 4 Dead feels like is not easy. But set Left 4 Dead to its highest difficulty level, recruit three of its best players you can find, push your way through one of the game's four scenarios, and make no mistake. What will go down will be so emotionally grueling, it will feel as though you have spent an hour playing something like full-contact psychic football. The end of the game, however it turns out, will feel epic to no one who did not take part in it, but those who did will feel as though they have marched together through a gauntlet of the damned. The game's refusal to explore the who, what, why, or how of its zombie citizenry is emblematic of the unusually austere approach to narrative in many Valve games, which the company may not have invented but has certainly come close to perfecting. The four controllable characters in Left 4 Dead are all common video game types. The girl, the black guy, the biker, the elderly Vietnam vet. They are not, however, blank canvases. I play as, in order of preference, the girl, the black guy, and the biker. I absolutely refuse to play as the Vietnam vet. For some reason, I can't stand the guy. Tactics that failed in the jungles and swamps of the Mekong Delta have no place against an army of the undead. <laughs> the object of the game is to fight your, through, fight your way through scenarios that are themselves divided into five stages, all of which, but for the scenario's finales, conclude with the players slamming shut a safe house's thick red metal door. The problem, of course, is that between these safe houses are devastated locales, a high-rise hospital, a train yard, an airport, a traffic tunnel, among others, filled with literally thousands of zombies looking to attack you, and even, sometimes, one another. You want a weird video game experience? Creep around a corner in the sewers adjacent to the hospital, say, and you might find, to your fascinated horror, a couple of unaware zombies casually beating each other up. It's, it's weird, I don't know. <laughs> These zombies attack singly or in groups or in what the game calls the horde. Standing in the middle of a darkened city street while a horde of zombies pours up and out of a subway station and clamors over and around parked cars to get to you is about as unnerving as video games get. And these are just the rank and file zombies. The far more perilous special infected is where Left 4 Dead begins to glitter. Thinking about the special infected has just dried my mouth out with terror, so... Uh. These special infected come in five nightmare flavors. The hunter, a hooded zombie who pounces upon and then tears into his prey, rendering the pouncy helpless until a friend comes along to shoot or push the hunter off. The smoker, a coughing, shambolic, elastically tongued zombie who operates much like a sniper, extending his tongue to pluck survivors from the pack. The boomer, an obese and separating slob zombie who is as fragile and explosive as a pinto, but whose vomit and bile attract the dreaded horde, 
and whose vomit on top of that is blinding so that during a well-coordinated attack, you cannot see the hunter tearing to pieces your screaming friend right in front of you. The tank, as advertised, a steroidally distended zombie as tough as an armored car, but who mercifully appears only a few times a game. And finally, the witch, a crying lost soul zombie who seems the very picture of helplessness until she is startled by a flashlight or a loud noise upon which she uses her razored manicure to instantly kill the survivor who startled her and whom you must try to sneak past and who is as generally upsetting and inspired a video game nemesis as any. What is so brilliant about these special infected is the way they tap into distinct types of emotional unease. For the hunter, it is shock, and for the smoker, helplessness. For the boomer, it is panic, and for the tank, flight. For the witch, it is a strange combination of alarm and paranoia and blame. These emotions, aroused as they are alongside other living gamers, are part of what makes a game with no traditional narrative to speak of so dynamically fertile an experience to look back on. Left 4 Dead creates, within a structure that is formally storyless but highly controlled, a game that feels to those playing it as harrowingly and expertly designed as a first-rate horror film. Credit here is due to the so-called AI director that Valve designed specifically for Left 4 Dead. It is most basically a piece of in-game co computation that monitors the gamers, judges their performance, and complicates things as it deems advisable. If things are going really swimmingly for the survivors, why not inflict upon them a tank? If the survivors are hurting, why not drop in an extra health pack? The AI director, which would not work in a game with an inflexible narrative structure, also ensures that the survivors are never attacked in the same place by the same number of enemies. The revelatory quality of this cannot be overstated. Gamers often learn how to master a game by memorization, but Left 4 Dead is impossible to master in this way. All one can do is hone strategies, which, especially on the highest difficulty level, have a toothpick house fragility. You do not get a delivered narrative in Left 4 Dead. What you do get is a series of found narratives. How do these found narratives work, and what gives them their resonance? Well, as it happens, I have a Left 4 Dead story, and it occurred while playing the game's versus mode, in which two human teams, one survivor, one zombie, have at each other. Playing against human-controlled special infected takes the robotically inflicted havoc of the AI director and turns it into something far more wonderfully and personally vicious. In versus mode, the object is to reach the safe house with as many living survivors as possible. The more survivors that make it, the more points your team receives. One night, at the end of the first stage of the Dead Air campaign, I and three fellow survivors, two of whom were friends, one of whom had just jumped in, had come to realize that we were up against a vilely gifted and absolutely devastating team of Left 4 Dead tacticians, the Hannibal, Napoleon, Crazy Horse, and Patton of zombies. They attacked with uncertain coordination, insurgent coordination, and to maximum damage, and it was only our own skill that had managed to hold them off as long as we had. By the time the first stage safe house came into view, we, four extraordinarily good Left 4 Dead veterans, were limping, hobbled, and completely freaked out. Then, another coordinated attack, led by the boomer puking on us, blinding us, and summoning the horde. While we staggered around, the smoker took hold of one friend while a hunter pounced on another. The other remaining survivor and I decided to break for the safe house door. Before getting there, my remaining friend was pounced on by yet another hunter. Although I freed him, I was still mostly blind, and my friend, despite having been released, was under assault by at least a dozen rapacious normal zombies. Deciding that one of us making it was better than none of us making it, I stepped inside the safe house door and closed it. Outside, the friend I had left behind managed to fight his way out of the horde and kill the smoker and hunter ripping apart the other survivors, who were now incapacitated and capable of getting up without help and quickly bleeding out, which is to say dying. Unfortunately, the heroic friend was himself incapacitated while doing this. While my three downed friends could shoot their sidearms, they could not rise. They needed me for that. In a minute or so, they would be dead, and from the shelter of the safe house, I watched their health bars drain steadily away. <laughs> Meanwhile, the opposing team had begun to respawn. A lone survivor against even two special infected opponents would stand no chance, as all it would take to end the round would be a hunter or a smoker incapacitating me. So I stayed put. Better one of us than none of us. My down friends failed to see it that way. <laughs> Over my headphones, they vigorously questioned my courage, my manhood, the ability of my lone female survivor to repopulate the human world on her own, and my understanding of deontological ethics. On the other side of the safe house door, I could hear the boomer belching, farting, and waiting for me to come out. You dick, one of my friends called out. He had just finished bleeding out, a skull appearing beside his on-screen name. My remaining friends were now seconds away from the same fate. I looked within did not like what I saw, 
steeled myself and fired several shotgun rounds through the door, safely killing the boomer, who it must be said behaved with uncharacteristic carelessness. When I opened the door, I saw a hunter a few feet away in a corner waiting to pounce, but I killed him before moving out of the safe room and into the street. The second hunter was better prepared, but with miraculous good luck, I managed to blast him out of the air in mid-pounce. I quickly hel helped up the first survivor, and together we made it out to the final remaining survivor, who was down to his last droplets of virtual existence. While I helped up the final survivor, my friend, covering me, eliminated the lurking smoker, and with glad cries, the three of us made it back to the safe house. At great personal risk, and out of real shame, I had rescued two of my three friends, and in the process outfaced against all odds one of the best Left 4 Dead teams I had and have ever played against. I realized then, vividly, that Left 4 Dead offered a rare example in which a game's theme, cooperation, was also what was encouraged within the actual flow of gameplay. The people I saved that night still talk about my heroic action. <laughs> And yes, it was. It did feel heroic whenever we play together. And after the round, two of the, team's opposing, two of the opposing team's members requested my online friendship, which with great satisfaction, I declined. <laughs> All the emotions I felt during those few moments, fear, doubt, res doubt, resolve, and finally courage, were as intensely vivid as any I have felt while reading a novel or watching a film or listening to a piece of music. For what more could one ask? What more could one want? I once raved about Left 4 Dead in a video game emporium with an earshot of the manager, a man I had previously heard angrily defend the position that lightsaber wounds are not necessarily cauterized. <laughs> His evidence, the Tauntaun Han Solo disembowels and the Empire Strikes Back, does, in fact, bleed. Left 4 Dead, he asked me. You liked it? I admitted that I did very, very much. And him? I liked it, he said grudgingly. I just wish there was more story. A few pimply malingerers, piqued by our exchange, nodded in assent. The overly caloric narrative content of so, many day, of so many games had caused these gentlemen to feel undernourished by the different narrative experience offered by Left 4 Dead. They, like the games they presumably loved, had become aesthetically obese. I then realized I was contrasting my aesthetic sensitivity to, to that of some teenagers about a game that concerns itself with shooting as many zombies as possible. It is moments like this that can make it so dispiritingly difficult to care about video games. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I think we will, because I think the people who are kind of um, reflexively conversant with the aesthetics of games are, are not going to be quite as horrified by you know, what an outsider would look at as happening on the screen and think, my god, how, that's just carnage and mayhem. What could that possibly mean? Um, and, you know, not all games are violent. A lot of the games I write about in the book are, so I should just say that right, right up top. But I, I did an interview on uh, New Hampshire Public Radio today, and I, I sort of stumbled upon something I kind of liked, uh, which is, you know, if you take, like, a rock song, and even if you looked, if you, like, had the tablature of it on, one, on here, and you had the lyrics of it here, and you looked at these things separately, it probably wouldn't seem like a whole heck of a lot is going on. But something about combining these two things and then you, the listener, hearing it or seeing it performed, something happens within the performance and, and, the, and the very act of reifying this thing that gives it this almost like sub-linguistic sensation that you get from it. And a lot of like violent games that you would look at them, or even games, period. Let's, not, let's just forget the violence part. Games, period, you look at them. And someone watching someone play could, would possibly think, what on earth could be going on there that is of any value? But there is something similar to the, the, the combination of these disparate elements in gameplay that creates something that can actually be really elegant and artful and, and, be, and can just sort of lasso your emotions in some really strange way. And it's, it's hard to talk about. And one of the reasons I write about narrative games so much, and my big concern is with narrative games in this book, partially because I'm a fiction writer, so I have like a traditional narrative kind of understanding for how I ground myself in these experiences, but also because I just found those games were so much easier to write about because the gameplay aspect is, I don't know if I've ever read a really good, like long form description of what that thing that they do is actually is. I don't know if anyone here has any insight into that, but um, you know, I thought I would start out, I would write this book and try to provide one and, and that, mission failed. But, um, but I do think that, that there is an aspect to games that people who grew up playing them and really appreciating them and thinking about them can, um, will very much be able 10 years from now to be able to identify within this medium things that are, that are not abstract and, and, and that actually have real aesthetic meaning. 
every medium develop any, every medium that anyone gives a damn about develops a tradition. This is actually like a real thing. This is not a trivial objection to the video game form. I mean, one, you basically have to learn a foreign language to play games with any amount of success. Um, like trying to people to just sort of ref understand like where valuable information is in interface systems. Um, I mean, you give someone a joystick, it's someone who's never held one, it's like you're giving them a detonator, you know? I mean, the, 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 and, and you know, I think gamers are kidding themselves that this isn't like a very real obstacle that people who might be inclined to think highly of what this form can do. And there's also the difficulty question because, you know, a lot of people who design games grew up as, quote, hardcore gamers, which is a term that I loathe. Um, but there's like a culture of difficulty. And so I don't really know what the answer to this question is. I mean, it's like, I guess it's in literature would be akin to modernism, you know. Um, game difficulty is, is like what games modernist movement is. And there's going to be people who want to bring games like, well, like the Wii. Is a, 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 Wii games are a perfect example of, of like trying to expand games to more people. And I think what's probably going to happen is there will be, like, the, 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 uh, the Ulysses of games is going to be the games that are really hard, and only the, like, the really devoted will get through it. And then there'll be, like, poppier games for, and, and that doesn't mean any worse, mind you, not, not necessarily worse or less sophisticated games, but poppier games that people can sort of just play and dip into to their own satisfaction. But, yeah, I think about that all the time. It's, it's a real issue. And I don't know how that gets addressed, actually. The question is about whether games are sort of striving toward a holodeckian intensity, a sense around intensity, or if the controller is a, like a crucial part of the game experience. All I know is that with the rise of this controllerless kind of game stuff, I'm f <laughs> it's so strange to admit this, but I feel like game fogeydom encreaching upon me. I'm like, don't take my controller away. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like this stuff is not for me. Uh, partially because everyone I've seen do that stuff looks preposterous. Um, and uh, I think it'll be those will be fun party stuff, but I also think, you know, part of the pleasure for people who take their games seriously is the precision of, of the experience. And, you know, until they get that stuff to a point where you can actually have a precise interaction with your environment, and I don't really know how you do that, um... You know, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't know where that stuff's going to go. I'm just going to take. I'm going to play Kreskin here and say that I think it's going to be a miserable failure. I, I might be wrong, but th that's my hunch. The question is, what do I think about Team Fortress Two? Um, well, yeah, uh, and how to? The question is like. D d <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's uh, Valve does that stuff really well. I mean, they're 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 projecting like meaning, whatever that is, like the, the kind of meaning video games are good at. They're doing it with very broad strokes, and they're doing it in a way that doesn't feel like thuddingly dull. And, um, but there's, you know, as much as I like a lot of the Valve games, I, 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 I have to confess I'm kind of a sucker for delivered narrative experiences. I really am. And I kind, of, I kind of long for a game that does it really well, and I'm increasingly beginning to think that maybe, may, maybe you just don't do that well in this medium. But I, I maintain, I believe, that the unicorn is out there, and we will catch it. <laughs> um, I've, uh, I, I like that game very much. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the question is, uh, is about the, the, this movement of like, very self-consciously ar artistic games. Um, you know, I've played the, probably the ones that everyone knows about, like the Passage and, and you know, um, uh, Jason Rohr's games, and, and I don't know if you'd put Braid in there, Space Giraffe, stuff like that. I really like those games a lot, um, very much. But as I said earlier, I just, I, I found it tormentingly difficult to write about those games in a way that felt to me engaging. And I could only say that, you know, you may like a Rothko painting in The Last Supper it, equally, but it's much easier to write about The Last Supper because <laughs> um, there's just stuff you can hang your thoughts on. And, you know, uh, so I find, like, what can you really say about a game like um, Jason, like Jason Rohr's games? You could really pretty much cover it in a paragraph. And, and, the, and it's not just, that's not a, pejor not a pejorative sense. I mean, uh, so for me, just my own talent sort of peters out at being able to express what's special about those games. You know, for better or for worse, I'm kind of more literarily and kinetically drawn to, to like, narrative games. Um, so that's, that's my inadequate answer on that one. But. Well, the, the question is whither writing about games, I think. Um, what's going to happen? Um, uh, Chris is and my colleague, this guy, Jamin Brophy Warren, who uh, Chris and he started this great magazine called Kill Screen, which is hedging its bets on this very subject. Do people 
read about games and uh uh, and this, my book's fate is, is hinged upon whether there's an audience for people who want to read this stuff. And my big fear is that there are people who love to read and love playing video games, but my big fear is that I personally know all of them. Um, <laughs> and so Jamin makes the point, uh, Jamin Brophy Warren, who I just mentioned, makes the point that video games sort of suffered the ill luck to have risen at the same time that the traditional media outlets that you think would have wanted to cover them kind of collapsed. And so there was just less of a space for that, uh, you know, that um, crossover to really happen. And so, you know, all the most interesting writing on games online is mostly done by people who are doing it out of love, and they're doing it for free. And people who are doing it for free do not have the time to devote, you know, to write long-form essays. I mean, so they're writing blog posts just out of, you know, cruel necessity. And so, you know, one of the reasons I hope this little project is a success because I hope it will open some space for more kind of books like this because I know mine is inadequate in any number of ways and and I want to read more kind of writing about games like this and I think you know one of the reasons Kill Space is going to be I think such an important magazine is because it's going to create more of that space and so you guys should really everyone seriously should buy at least three copies of my book and then but no um, so we need to support it is what I'm saying we need to support it and uh, Publishers and magazines are only going to cover the stuff if they think people actually want it. And I think it just remains to be seen whether, whether people do. The question is if uh, it's more about these traditional media places collapsing, providing a lack of spaces for these things to run, or just the, the gatekeepers of these more traditional media things not caring. I think it's actually both. Uh, and I think it actually might be a little bit more of what you're saying. Um, I've been very lucky to write about games in some places that you know wouldn't cover it, but uh, this is my advice to aspiring game writers, and I don't mean this flippantly at all, but if you want to write about games in, like, for magazines that that don't typically want to r want pieces about games, you should write about something else for, like, a decade. <laughs> um, you should try to form, like, your own sort of ar uh, audience or your own sort of area of concerns that are apart from this subject, because there is, and I don't say this, like, approvingly, but there is, like, a sense that people who come out of strictly game writing kind of don't, and it's often not fair, but I'm just trying to tell it the way it is, often don't have the same kind of journalistic probity of, of uh, you know, more established journalists. And again, I'm putting lots of scare quotes around everything I just said, but I think that's the perception. So I think it would, it would do well, you know, journalists to be journalists and writers first, and then sort of write about games as just one of many things you write about. I know I'm perfectly aware that no one would have published this book had I not published several books before it. Um, that's just the way it is, and that's and so yeah. So people interested in this should 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 have a lot of th writing things on their plate. I think that's that's kind of going to be a necessity to convince people who are skeptics that there actually is something here. Uh, the question is about the the, the fate of plot heavy games. Um, and and like I, I look at the multiplayer games that all the kids like. Um, I kind of look at them as like sedentary sports you know uh, they're not aesthetically really that interesting it's all it's all about competition it's about crushing your friends talking smack with some 15 year old in Omaha and um, often with when I have uh, parents ask me if if children should play violent games I say no I want all those kids off the servers because they're really good and I'd like to get <laughs> as many of them off as possible <laughs> no. um, uh, I you know my, my bias is for is for narrative games but I also, I mean, I just have to put it out there that the way games do narrative, or at least the way most games do narrative, is just not sufficient for me. It, 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 I don't think they do it very well in the way that I, I think they could. And we could have a long conversation about that, but I, des I love narrative games. I love them. And uh, I just think there's a, like a variety of game experiences you can have, just like a variety of films you can watch, a variety of novels. Sometimes I want to read a Charles Portis novel. Sometimes I want to read, I almost said Brady Snellis, but no, I never want to read a Brady Snellis novel. Um, sometimes I want to read, uh, you know, something slightly older. And, and I think games, as, the, as this library expands, there's just going to be more of a like sensation of there's lots of kinds of experiences you can have out there. And not every one of them has to has to matter. You know, some of them can just be what they are. Yeah, that's a great question. The question is about what kinds of intelligence do video games develop? Well, I'm pretty certain it damages certain kinds of intelligence. And I don't mean that flippantly. I mean, I just find it, you know, I spent a year and a half playing games and writing this book. And then I would sit down to read, like, a, like I sat down to read uh, one of my favorite writers, Vladimir Nabokov. I sat down to read The Defense. 
and he writes very dense prose. And I like, for the first time in my life, I had to like focus and go through this like atmospheric re-entry before I went in, in to the book. And so I'm not saying I'm not saying that to damn games. I'm just saying that it's it's pretty clear to me, at least, it's borne out in my life that games do do something that makes you less able to concentrate at what we would call like traditionally concentration heavy kinds of aesthetic interaction. That said, games also um, there's no doubt there's tons of prob problem solving stuff, t tons of like cognitive stuff that games do, and and one of the reasons I think the military likes young people who play lots of games is because games teach you to like look at something that has literally thousands of bits of incoming information at you and figure out what is the important stuff. I don't think like shooters make people want to go out and kill people, well-adjusted people, any more than, than um, you know, I mean, I think that's kind of, I, I don't think kids under the age of 17 should play violent games, period. I mean, I, I don't think that. I, I, if I had kids, I, there's no way in hell I would let them play the games that I like. That said, for someone with a fully formed moral conscience, I don't think violent games make them want to hurt anyone. And the military has actually experimented with shooter stuff and seeing if it makes people better, more, you know, soldiers. And it, there doesn't seem to be any combat benefit. But it does, in fact, train people to just look at something and be able to figure out what's significant within their field of vision. And that's, whether that's, you know, um, a hugely beneficial thing in life, I mean, I don't think it's the worst thing either. Um, so I think there are co different kinds of, like, quick reaction stuff that games definitely, definitely help. Um, I think. Uh, the question uh, is, you know, what wither educational video games? I was just, I was at E3 and I met a friend of mine who works at Sony and uh, I asked him what he'd done and he said he'd just come from a uh, meeting with some educational video game makers and I was like, what that's like? And he's like, their games are terrible. Um, they've always, educational games are just not very good. I, uh, the question is, are most educational, yeah, I think that's the problem. Uh, most educational games are made by people I don't think, this is my, my own opinion, just like I think Connect is doomed to failure, I think games in the classroom is a pretty tough sell. I, I, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I'm having a hard time imagining how something that's structured the way like an entertainment game could work in that way, which isn't to say like the grammar of games can't be used to aid educational experiences, the form that certain aspects of the medium are conducive. Uh, I'm going to give my, my most honest answer possible. I just write the book that I, the non-writer me, would like to read, and I hope other people like it. Um, that's, that's, my, like, that's my top level aspiration. My lower level aspiration for this book was, uh, and I've said this a couple times before in interviews, um, I wanted to write a book to, to try to convince people who were not convinced by video games' aesthetic legitimacy why they were wrong, and I wanted to try to tell people who are convinced about video games' aesthetic legitimacy why their case isn't as good as they think it is. Um, so I kind of went right up the middle, satisfy no one plan. So um, <laughs> uh, um, the original title of this book was Extra Lives, Why Video Games Matter, Dash, and Why They Don't Matter More, which the good people of Random House convinced me was the worst subtitle for this uh, <laughs> this book imaginable and I think they were right um, so yeah I just tried to write the book that I and my friends who care about games and care about writing would, would want to read that, that was the best of my that was my biggest option the question uh, the, 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 uh, the um, question well that's the question the point was that there are people using games in educational ways and um, yeah I guess it's probably just a failure of my own nerve and imagination to imagine it but um, uh, did anyone here play Dante's Inferno um, that was kind of uh, that was kind of crazy. This is a game that you know took you know the, the the one of the founding poems of Western literature and turned it into a video game. Um, the really fun part about it though was one of the things the game did is you were you'd be running through hell and you would come across like some historical figure and you would have the option to pardon or condemn them condemn them. And so I came up to Pontius Pilate and I was like, oh, I'm going to pardon him. I mean, he didn't really know. I mean, you know. <laughs> He had no idea. So, pardon Pontius Pilate. He goes to heaven. Then I came upon Orpheus. I was like, dude, you followed your girlfriend into hell. You, of course you knew what was going on. Condemn. So, um, <laughs> I thought that was like a really fun kind of, like kids who don't know any of this stuff, you know, would be, be like, I, I was sort of like, that was not very educational, but it certainly was like a way to scratch the educational part of your brain a little bit. I, uh, the question is, have I tried interactive fiction? And uh, I hope you're not a fan, because every time I've tried it, I've like run screaming for the hills. Um, 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I look, I, I like games because they give me like stuff to branch off and they give me narrative variability. I like that stuff. I like fiction because I like being led by someone with a certain amount of ambiguity as to what I mean. I like like fiction that does that. I don't know. It's just I'm, I'm a fogey again. I, um, well, no, I mean like fiction, fiction. See, the, this is this is this is the really promising stuff that I love about games is that I think that like, game designers that are going to exploit like a situation as easy as trying to remember someone's name at a party using like normal figuring out ways to make clever involving gameplay mechanics that exploit sources of anxiety and tension that do not involve picking up an armament um i mean i think that's like a great path that i wish more designers would actually do more with but anyway i guess uh we're done thank you